Okay, so our first speaker for this session is Mark Lewis. Okay, my topic is design for a corpus of scanned verse, but actually I'm going to add an S because uh, I'm going to be pluralistic about this. The, uh, I start from the observation that research on poetic form has been largely corpus-based for a very long time simply because it's the study of something that people have done and poets have done primarily rather than of the intuitions of the analysts. But the normal practice has been for researchers to examine bodies of metered verse by hand or perhaps by marking up paper copies. And it's now easy in principle to create and share digital collections of variously annotated verse. And some data sets of this kind have appeared. For example, Bruce Hay's collection of Shakespeare's sonnets and uh, less commonly known in, this, in these circles, I think Richard Lead's collection of scanned Shakespeare. Um, but for this sort of work to fulfill its promise, we need a sort of what, what computer scientists call a data model and corresponding exchange format and associated programs with certain properties. Um, we'd like the op option for multiple and extensible layers of representation, orthography, syllables, stress, phonology, and morphology, syntax, and so on. Um, the option for multiple versions of a given type of annotation, that is scansion or pronunciation from different sources. Um, Bruce, Bruce's uh, work on Shakespeare's sonnets actually meets these criteria in that they're scansions from two different people and they're multiple layers of representation syllable by syllable um, and some sensible way to deal with multiple editions and variant readings. Um, so this talk, it, this according to my abstract, will put forward a straw man proposal for a simple conceptual structure that meets these needs. Uh, I have such a simple conceptual structure, but I'm not going to tell you what it is for reasons that will become clear later. So uh, I'm going to start with something that was also reproduced, I think, in Bruce's handout, namely a table from Halley and Kaiser's English Stress, Its Form, Growth, and Its Role in Verse, 1971, um, which uh, um, gives a table of possible verse, uh, possible metrical structures for verse in Beowulf, um, the table was, uh, instances of the, f the patterns in the table were counted um, by uh, a woman who was then, Anne Reed, who was then a student of Jay's, as I understand, and is still around. Um, I don't think that her scanned version of Beowulf is available online, but perhaps this can be remedied. Um, in, uh, in the current, workshop. Uh, this is just taken from the abstract of one of the uh, poster papers, uh, Quantitative Study of the Cesure in Baudelaire and Verlaine's Alexandrine. Um, this is just the uh, top of the front page from Richard Reed's Shakespeare Scan, the plays in visual pentameter. He has all of the plays and a bunch, quite a bit of Chaucer and some other stuff. And this is sort of what it looks like. That is, uh, these are as presented on the web, there are PDF files with uh, boldface and other typographical introductions that allow you to read it and determine his view of how it should be scanned. And uh, here's some of his front matter explaining the notations that he uses. And it, it's interesting to compare his notations and his annotation with Bruce's. They overlap to some extent, and they're different to some extent. Um, I've, uh, uh, Richard Reed is, is no longer alive, um, but his uh, son and heir agreed that it would be a fine thing for the results of his work to be turned into a digital corpus that could be shared and used by others. And so I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that. Um, here's a, a bit of um, the beginning of the the uh, Shakespeare sonnets corpus from Hayes, Wilson, and Shisko, Maxent Grammars for the Metrics of Shakespeare and Milton. Um, at least th this wasn't published with the paper as far as I know, but it's the, the online corpus which lies behind it. And you can see that, there's, that for each line of the, of the sonnet, there's actually a series of lines, one that gives the syllables, and then one that gives the stresses, and one that gives the junctures, and one that gives comments, if any, and so on. 
Now, uh, the nice thing about this kind of machine-readable corpus is that it lowers the threshold for exploration, and so I thought it would be appropriate to do a little simple-minded exploration of Bruce's corpus. Um, so actually, during the session yesterday, uh, I engaged in a few minutes of coding and did the following thing. So this uh, shows us um, thy, my, and your, their relative frequencies by position in the 10 syllable, 10 position line. And you can see, unsurprisingly, I think, that they, their relative frequency follows the iambic pattern of the line. Their, um, uh, um, commoner in the odd positions rather than in the even positions, and there's some modulation of the uh, relative strength of the even versus odd positions, which may reflect general metrical strength, but also probably reflects aspects of English syntax and perhaps Shakespeare's style. Um, here's the same plot for but, and, and or. Again, they track one another quite well. They do show also the alternating iambic pattern, but also, but now the first position is especially uh, likely to occur for the simple reason that um, but, and, and or tend to be phrase initial. Um, here's uh, do and doth, and now we get the first sort of puzzle, um, because although they're, they're relatively unstressed, function word monosyllables, they don't, well, doth maybe a little bit does, but they certainly don't overall show us a very clear, even odd division. And not only that, but they seem different from one another. And this is not completely random because they both occur about 90 times in the sonnets. So, you know, the, the, the numbers are not, although not enormous, are not trivial. Um, here's all and some, which again are quite different in interesting ways. Uh, I showed this to Bruce and he said this confirmed a speculation of his that all was actually a rather stressed word in Shakespeare. Um, you can see it, for example, it often occurs in position two. Um, here's uh, are and is, which again deviate from one another a bit. Um, here's uh, that, the, and this. Um, here's uh, um, have and be. Here's uh, thou, I thou, and me thee, um, which behave, I think, about as we would expect. Um, so the point here is not that these bring us crucial insights, but that they pose interesting, sometimes fairly trivial puzzles, sometimes more curious puzzles that we might learn something from following up on. And it was, it, it was a matter of a few minutes to generate these, and it would be a matter of a few seconds to generate a similar uh, plot for any arbitrarily selected word. And of course, if we had all of Shakespeare scanned in this way, we could get you know, more reliable numbers, and we could look by date and by edition and so on. Okay, so now for something not completely different, namely musical text setting. Um, and again, Bruce has led the way, um, among other places, in Hayes and Kahn, the role of phonological phrasing in sung and chanted verse in the Linguistic Review, 1996. And uh, there, again, there's a corpus that lies behind some of this work, at least, uh, where there are um, uh, songs where, again, we have a line that shows the division into syllables and the stresses, um, then uh, um, information about clitic versus host, where phonological phrase breaks are, uh, where intonational phrase or utterance breaks are, um, the weight of the stressed syllables, and then the whole thing there's this longer line that indicates within a kind of 16-unit pattern, typically typical for a couple of bars of 4-4 four, four time, where the syllables occur when sung. Um, and again, there are lots of lines of this, of this type. So this is a slightly different, in the case of the Shakespeare sonnets, you're basically partitioning the line into 10 units, and that tells you or maybe sometimes 11, but basically that tells you where it, how it fits the meter. Here you partition the line into units, but that actually doesn't tell you everything you need to know about how it fits the, the musical meter, at least. You still need to know where the syllables go. Um, so uh, here you can do this with more recent and different sorts of uh, things. 
So. Broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stage. You know they just don't care. I can't take the smell. Can't take the noise. Got no money to move out. I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room. Roaches in the back. Junkies in the alley with the baseball bat. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far. Because a man with the touch of repossessed my car. Okay, so that's the first verse of the message from 1982 during the, the, the classic period, or per, perhaps the Baroque period, I'm not sure, but anyway, <laughs> of, of, of rap music, um, maybe on the boundary between Baroque and classic. Uh, and this, this much of it is pretty, pretty clearly, as with Bruce Hayes' folk songs, divided up into 16 units. And they're pretty much organized four plus four plus four plus four. And you can sort of see that if you do the simple thing. I didn't bother to notate all the stresses and so on, um, but I just counted how many syllables there were lined up with each position of whatever kind. And uh, if we do that, and, and the four plus four plus four plus four also really basically seems to correspond with this kind of um, hierarchically divided duple rhythm in this much of the song. Um, and we get a pattern that looks like that, so there's a sort of initial upbeat, and then we're basically getting an alternating pattern that's quite like the alternating pattern that we would expect to see in the folk songs. Um, but, and, and this, this is true for all, um, for the first five verses, if you add them all up. Um, however, when we get to the chorus, things are, which is repeated after each verse, things are a little bit different. Don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Okay, so this, here the 16 beats are divided up pretty much as 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 plus 3. Um, maybe something a little more like that. And if we take the words of the chorus, um, as he sings it through the whole uh, um, series of verses and choruses, um, we're getting a mixture of duple and triple units, which I think it's pretty clear from the way he performs it, he takes as emblematic of mental disintegration, um, although that's not really its traditional role in American popular music. Um, but if we compare uh, the, uh, the first couple of verses where the syllables fall with the chorus, looking at the blue lines, you can see the rather striking difference, which you could think of as a syncopation, or you could think of as a polyrhythmic alternative. Now, uh, later in the performance, there's actually a shift in the second half lines away from the perfectly square rhythm towards an, an anticipation that involves some three-syllable uh, three units. It was plain to see that your life was lost. You was cold and your body swung back and forth. But now your eyes sing the sad, sad song of how you live so fast and die so young. So if you compare the, the first two verses versus verse five, you can see that in, towards the end of the song, you're getting this um, anticipation, basically, where um, beats uh, 13 and 15, or units 13 and 15, are getting syllables placed, which are just ahead of the place where the downbeat is still being marked by the music. Um, and this kind of mixture of triple and duple units has been common in African-influenced popular music for 150 years, uh, at least starting with the so-called Concordanza Habanera, which became popular in the late 19th century and had, a, had eight time units divided, three plus three plus two, which everyone thought was really neat. Um, Jelly Roll Morton called this the Spanish tinge and said you had to have it to make proper jazz music. Um, and you can see this same, and this, this is again the more modernly common 16-bit division, but you can see this in a, with a different take, that is now, this is no longer mental degeneration. So, you know, the, in, in more recent, well, in general, in, in earlier and also later, um, American popular music, this mixture of duple and triple rhythms um, is extremely common and plays all kinds of different uh, artistic roles. 
it remains contested, I think, whether you should treat this as a surface structure syncopation, that is, a, as a kind of shift of what's an underlyingly square rhythm, which is what Davy Temperley, who's a musicologist at Columbia, has suggested in a 1999 paper called Syncopation in Rock, or whether you should see it as the effect of a fundamentally polyrhythmic structure, which is actually how I would prefer to see it in most of this music, or maybe both at once, or one of the things that makes this music interesting may be the fact that you can think of it both ways. Okay, so anyway, a metrically annotated corpus of popular music, including rap, but all going back 150 years into other forms, um, would include information about, as in Bruce's uh, folk song corpus, about how the syllables line up with the, met with the musical meter. Um, but it might also include other phonetic properties of reading, singing, and chanting. Um, for example, this is a quite trivial example, but here's uh, Yeats reading a stanza from a poem of his that I think was written in the early 1930s, but this reading is from 1937. Sound of a stick upon the floor, a sound that somebody that toils from chair to chair, beloved books, a thing whose hands are bound, old marble heads, old pictures everywhere, great rooms where travel men and children found content or joy, a last inheritor where none has reigned but left the name and pain or out of folly into folly pain. So this is just iambic pentameter, um, but it, um, it's, I've noted the silent pause durations in milliseconds, and it seems to me not out of the question that there might be some interest in looking at, for example, why it is that there's such a long pause after beloved books, why the pause here in the middle of the line is longer than the pause at the end of the line. And this obviously reflects both, in, in, to some extent, the syntactic structure, and in other cases, a sort of uh, division for emphasis, for example, of the beloved books phrase. Um, OK, so uh, now let's go back to Richard Reed's Shakespeare Scanned and briefly take note of the problem of variant readings, about which I don't have a great deal productive to say except that they exist and that we, we might want to take account of them in general or whether or not we would do it in this situation. So uh, here's um, Reed's scansion of the beginning of Hamlet. And uh, so it's Bernardo and Francisco and, and one of them is relieving the other and they're, this is before the king, the ghost comes and so on. Um, and uh, this is based mostly, although not entirely, on the first folio from 1623. And I, I just wanted to, we're going to take a look at this line, if you do meet Horatio and Marcellus. Whoops. Um, the rivals of my watch bid them make haste, but if you do meet Horatio and Marcellus. So this is during the time when due support was, when English was getting a little bit overenthusiastic about due support and was using it even in positive present tense sentences as opposed to in questions and negatives and so on, but not entirely. Um, uh, so anyway, in the first folio, we get this if you do meet Horatio and Marcellus. In the first quarto, we get and if you meet Marcellus and Horatio. So there's no do, and we get and if, and now it's Marcellus and Horatio instead of Horatio and Marcellus. And uh, in the second quarto, it's uh, also if you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, so the do is back. So it's sort of two out of three have do, so I guess the do wins. Um, but I, the, the point is that, that there are quite a few differences among the editions, and of course, you know, for other poets, there are similar sorts of things. Uh, so, um, summing up, um, the number of different designs for metrical corpora, and I haven't laid out all of the ones that I'm familiar with, although there are not a lot of them that have been published, is unfortunately comparable to the number of metrical corpora extant. 
um, there, as I said, in comparing uh, Richard Reed and Hayes, there's clearly a lot of overlap in the content, in the sort of conceptual underpinnings, but the details are actually quite, can be quite different. Now, it would be easy enough to create an abstract data model that would allow all existing designs as special cases, but I would be concerned that the next project might add some new features, and we wouldn't also want to prevent someone from doing that. Um, so in my opinion, what we want is a way of thinking about the, enti the relevant entities and relations, linguistic, metrical, musical, bibliographical, and so on. On the linguistic side, we do want to distinguish, um, uh, for example, between syllables as abstract units and syllables as strings of characters in the orthography and syllables as bundles of phonological, structured phonological features and syllables as bearers of stress and location in words and so on. And we want a way of representing all of those things that allows us to work across them. And Bruce has come up with quite a, a useful way of doing that, but there would be, you know, there would be some other things that we might want to add and some ways that we might want to abstract what he did. Um, we do need convenient formats and methods for entry, search, presentation, and exchange. And again, Bruce and his co-workers have provided such things in f for, the, the, for what they did. Um, there's, a, there's something that produces a rough draft um, uh, scansion. Um, that allows you to correct the scansion, that allows you to search for things, and so on. But I think uh, we might want to try doing that again in a somewhat more modern um, web database framework. Um, and we want instantiations of all of this for areas of active research, so for classical pentameter, for hendecosyllabics, for alexandrines, um, for maybe for rap. For, for other kinds of thing, for French folk songs, whatever. And how to get it? Well, I think Bruce's ideas are an excellent place to start. They're the, the most highly developed approach to doing this that I'm aware of. Um, but I think we might want to add and subtract appropriately, uh, for example, for a machine readable version of Lead Scan Shakespeare. Um, and then iterate. You know, do it, let people do research with it, uh, see where it works and where it doesn't work, and then do it over again, rather than believe that we're going to get it absolutely right the first time. Um, so if you're interested, get in touch with me. Um, and with a little bit of luck, I'll persuade you to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I will help. <laughs> um, and that's it, I'm done. Everybody's worried that if they say something, I'll ask them to do this. <laughs> What's an exchange format? So uh, um, inside a database, there's some kind of arrangement of bits. And um, you, if you had exactly the same computer and exactly the same version of the software and so on, you could just dump those bits and then read them back in. But that would be very fragile. Um, because it would assume that you had exactly the same computer and operating system and version of the software. So instead, people devise exchange formats, which are just a way of external, th think of it if, as a linguist, you know, think of it as externalization, <laughs> all right? You're, you're taking the internal contents of what would otherwise be a very difficult to assimilate. I mean, you could do a brain dump, but in fact, it would it not only, it would be possible in that case, but not very useful because you know, five years later when the operating system is different or if somebody wants to use a different piece of software or something, it wouldn't work anymore. And so you want to devise a way of externalizing the conceptual structure, the, the data model and its contents, um, which is syntactically well-defined and therefore sort of machine readable. You can say, all right, what you do is you parse it according to this schema that I have published and that will allow you to upload, to assimilate its content. Um, now, exchange formats are sometimes not very human readable. Um, they may or may not be. They can be designed to be more or less human readable. But so you also want presentation formats. 
um, which may leave out some of the crucial information, but also are going to format in a way that works for the eye and the brain of humans as opposed to uh, the needs of computers. And so, so exchange formats and presentation formats tend to be different. Yeah. So I was sort of amused because you, your talk went into my kitchen and you know, saw all the pancake batter on the floor and the, the 1950 blender on the counter <laughs> and so on. Uh, but I, I thought I would mention a couple other things that, that happen in the kitchen because they bear on the possibility of us getting really big corpora. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, we try to automate uh, the annotation of stress and phrasing as much as possible. So for instance, my little bits of software know what are the function words of English so that they know that they're stressless and know that they're characteristically criticized to adjacent content words. The toil, the handwork that was necessary basically involved the application of two well-known rules from the literature. Uh, one was Lisa Selkirk's edge rule, namely the location of uh, right edges of XPs uh, because they are characteristically uh, phrased more loosely from what follows than the other stuff. Uh, and the other rule was uh, Chomsky and Halley's nuclear stress rule, that once you have the XPs, then you can typically assign greater prominence to the right edge. Uh, so these are what take forever, uh, even you know, with little, little convenience software to try to enter in these things as fast as possible. It takes hours and hours and hours to do these corpora. Uh, so I think the next step, if we're going to try and do all of Shakespeare, would be to try and automate the application of these rules. And of course, what's needed for that is someone who's really good at syntactic parsing, uh, so good that they could parse highly irregular material like Shakespeare's sonnets, uh, at which point I suspect the machine-generated uh, prosodic annotations would be close enough to human uh, as to be actually useful, and then let us do stuff like do the whole Shakespeare corpus. Yeah, I think there, so I have uh, um, uh, three things to say. There are pretty good parsers around, although how well they would work on Shakespearean um, verse language, I'm not sure. Um, second, uh, um, independent of general parsing, there are, you could train a chunker using modern machine learning techniques which would probably be, would undoubtedly be better than what you have now and might be pretty good. And there are people who like to do that kind of thing. It's a relatively well-plowed field by now. Uh, but the third thing is that to the extent that you could get classes that would teach this stuff, I mean, um, there's linguistics classes, but then there's also English poetry classes and so on, um, you could crowdsource some of that work and everybody would win because the fact is you have to do a certain amount of scansion by hand in order to learn how the verse works. Um, you, you don't want it all just handed to you in the beginning. And so, you know, if uh, you could get um, even a thousand students across the country, which I think is quite, quite doable, um, to spend an hour or two each as a homework assignment um, scanning a few lines and you would get, you know, several of them to scan the same lines and you would do majority vote to check for correctness and so on. I th and all you would really need would be a version of your tools that worked in a web browser, basically. Um, and I think you could, you could easily crowdsource it in that way. Yes? No so, kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, it, but I'll totally be down to help you on that study. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Great idea. <coughs> Is there a... Oh, oh, okay. Nigel Fab, um, I, I wanted to mention actually that there's also a very big um, Shakespeare corpus that my colleague Jonathan Hope and Mike Whitmore from the Fogger Shakespeare Library Constructed, it's a tagged corpus of all of Renaissance drama, including, of course, all of Shakespeare. It's tagged 
um, syntactically and lexically. They haven't done any phonological work on it, but it's all there in digital form. Okay. What they're actually doing with it is they're doing, um, they, they're running a, a program to try and work out le lexical similarities so that they're basically, they're, they're separating out. For example, with the tragedies and the comedies and the, the histories of Shakespeare, they've shown that the tragedies and the histories have a particular lexical characteristics. The comedies have different ones. And they've also identified a whole circle around uh, Sydney. Uh, which they hadn't previously suspected, mm. just from the lexical structure of the is plays. Is this the text myth stuff or whatever it's? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah it's, I, it's, I, it's funded by Carnegie. That. I'm not very familiar with it. That's right, and it's a yeah. Folger Shakespeare Library. It's a very, very big project. Yeah. So, yeah. so but, but they're not that doing... at least has uh, part of speech tagging. Does it actually also have syntactic phrasing of some kind? No, I don't think so. I think they're just tagging for words. Um, yeah. But it's it's but it's you know but it's, it's a still big that's thing. something. Yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. And uh, it would be very nice to, well, so I've gone so far as to make a, a uh, glossary of all of the word forms that occur in Shakespeare. And uh, there aren't all that many of them. And getting a set of uh, stress assignments um, for those words, for the polysyllables, um, would not be an enormous amount of work. I mean, obviously, it would be trivial if you got it from a modern dictionary, but we would want to do it, want the syllabification and the stress assignments to reflect his practice. But, but again, that's the kind of thing that could probably, you know, it probably represents a, a couple of dozen hours, but if it were spread over a few people, it wouldn't be too bad. And then you could, then you, th there are, of course, multiple um, syllabifications that can occur with the same word. It, um, but if you had all of them in there, then you just pull them out and try it out. Okay, well, I think I've... I've <laughs>